Let's stand on our feet. Oh, we worship you, Lord. Exceedingly, abundantly, more than we can ask or think. Sing it out. When did I start to forget all of the great things you did? And when did I throw away faith for the impossible? How did I start to believe that you weren't sufficient for me? Why do I talk myself out of seeing miracles? Yeah. We just sing this. You are more than able. I've seen it in my own life. I've seen it in my own life. Yes. You are more than able. Since you are. faith rise because you are more than able who am I to deny what the Lord can do you walk who you say you are you started in me, oh God is more than able, 
Your word doesn't return for us. God is more than able. You speak light and there's light. See you.
the enemy is already defeated. Sing this with me in victory. The reign of darkness. The reign of darkness now has ended. In the kingdom of light. In the kingdom of light. Forever under your dominion. You're the king of my life. You're the king of my life. You reign above it all, you reign above it all, declare. And over the universe, and over every heart, there is no higher name. Jesus, you reign above it all. On the cross, the word was finished. God, you poured out your
That day when evening came, he said to his disciples, Let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along, just as he was, in the boat. There were also other boats with him. A furious squall came up, and the waves broke over the boat, so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. Then the wind died down, and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, Who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. Good evening. Good to see you guys. Happy Wednesday. Hey, turn in your Bibles to Mark chapter 4. Our passage tonight, which you just heard on the screen, um, I imagine is not unfamiliar to you. It's one of the most familiar stories. Um, that many of us know in the life of Jesus. That's true, both of us, and it's true throughout church history. There's a reason this story shows up in three out of the four Gospels, Matthew, Luke, and Mark, the story of Jesus asleep on a boat in the Sea of Galilee. Um, I want to unpack it a little bit for us tonight um, and see if we can see something in it that maybe we haven't seen before. Now, the story itself as you're probably familiar with, is um, straightforward enough. And what I mean by that is if you read commentators, um, if you read commentators, there's not a whole lot that you can find to disagree on with most of it. The story itself is pretty straightforward, at least in the narrative. And you know it well. Jesus gets on a boat with his disciples. He goes to sleep. A big storm comes up. The disciples start to panic. The boat starts to take on water. They wake Jesus up. Jesus gets up, calms the wind and the the waves. They obey him. Everything goes back to normal. The disciples are spooked. And if the story just stopped right there, I guess the, the implication would be similar to what the disciples' response was. Who is this, right? And we could spend a lot of time debating it or at least reflecting on the nature of what it means about who Jesus is. But, but what makes this story, what takes it to a different level, if you will, the whole thing really hinges on verse 40. Verse 40 takes this from just a narrative that's crazy and worth discussion, but verse 40 is where you get this different thing entirely, this question that Jesus asks of his disciples after he calms the winds when he says, Why are you afraid, and where is your faith? Why are you afraid, and where is your faith? That's where, if you read the commentators, you're going to get a whole lot of stuff. What did Jesus mean by that? What did Jesus mean by rebuking his disciples, telling them, why are you afraid, and where is your faith? That's the central question that I want to try to unpack for us briefly here tonight. What did Jesus mean by that? Because if we can understand the answer to that question, right, then notice how it has a whole lot of practical implications on our life as followers of Jesus. Because we could turn around and ask ourselves the same question. Where is it in my life that Jesus would look at me and go, why are you afraid? Where is your faith? So here's how I want to approach it tonight. Um, Well, first, when reflecting on what Jesus meant by those two questions, why are you afraid, I want to consider two common interpretations of perhaps what he meant and see if they sort of hold up to scrutiny. And then I want to try to propose maybe a third way a third way of trying to answer that question of what Jesus meant. The first one would simply be this, and maybe you've heard it before. 
The first one would simply be this. Jesus told his disciples, why are you afraid? Where is your faith? Or he asked them that because maybe he meant by that that if the disciples only had this thing called faith, then they could have told the wind and the waves to be still and they would have obeyed them. Right? So if only they had whatever it is we mean by faith, if they could get in on that, then why are they going to bother him with it? And now you might think that sounds like a stretch. I'm like, who actually believes that? But the truth is, there's a lot of people who think of faith as your capacity to do something crazy. There's a lot of people who think of faith as some sort of substance, if you will, that gives you and I the capacity to do things that are irrational. And so only if we had some of this faith, then we could pray that sickness away. If only you had some faith, you could get the job that you wanted. If only you had some faith, you could get out of the jam that you're in right now. And so faith becomes measured by my capacity to act in a way that seemingly goes against reason. And here's the thing. Here's why it's a bit of a catch-22. Because if I don't pray the sickness away, well, then I must just not have had faith. So it leaves me sort of in this vicious cycle. That surely can't be what Jesus means here. I mean, that surely can't be. Surely Jesus didn't mean by this that he expected that his disciples would somehow be able to come to the place where they could tell the wind and the waves to obey. If that is what Jesus meant, then that's not working out very well for most of his followers. If you know anyone that can tell the weather what to do, let me know. That could be useful. That can't be what Jesus meant. So the second option it's maybe a little better, but it goes something like this. Maybe what Jesus meant when he told his disciples, why are you afraid, where is your faith, is simply that they had no reason to be afraid because think about who was in the boat with them. It's a little bit like this. It, I wonder if Jesus meant by this, hey, don't you know who I am? I'm Jesus. If I'm in the boat with you, then you don't got to be afraid because I'm just going to get up and I'm going to go to the side of the boat and I'm going to tell the wind and the waves to shut up and they're going to stop. So you don't need to be afraid because I'm in the boat with you. Now this one's a little better. It sounds better than option one because at least now it's placing faith in Jesus and maybe not in my own capacity. But I don't think it holds up to scrutiny. And here's why. Because if I was on the boat and I was Peter, and that's what Jesus meant, I would have gone to Jesus and said, hey, Jesus, that's why we woke you up. I'm like, why are you coming back at, why, why, are you, why are you clapping back at me, Jesus? Like, that's why we woke you up. And guess what? Worked out. You told the, you, you got us out of this jam. So why is Jesus upset with his disciples? Why is he rebuking them for their lack of faith if what he meant by faith was simply that as long as he's in the boat with them, they would be good? It also doesn't really hold up if you just consider your own experience because um, even if it is true, I'm, steer, I'm still unclear what I'm supposed to do with that information, right? If faith is measured by the fact that as long as Jesus is in the boat with me, right, then I'm safe from the storm, then how can I ensure in any given situation that Jesus is in the boat? I mean, I don't know about you, but I've prayed many times in situations for God to act, for God to do something, and it doesn't seem like he answered it, certainly not in the way that I was asking. So does that mean Jesus wasn't in the boat with me? See, these, these initial sort of options that I think people just kind of surface level grab and presume about this passage, like if you look at it closely, it's, there's something else going on here. They don't really hold up. So where does it leave us? Well, I want to try a third way tonight with you to try to ask this question. What did Jesus mean? And let's consider this third way first by just asking this question. 
can write this down and reflect on it. How do you suppose that Jesus would have preferred his disciples to respond that night? How would Jesus have preferred his disciples to respond that night? I mean, let's be clear real quick. Here they are in a boat, and it's taking on water. These are professional fishermen, by the way. These are men who have lived most of their lives on that water. They're not naive. They know what happens when boats take on water. They've gotten out of jams before when Jesus wasn't in the boat, this time seemingly a little bit different. So this isn't just like their ignorance. So what were they supposed to do? How were they supposed to respond otherwise? Jesus rebukes them for their lack of faith, and he marvels. He rebukes them for their fear, and he marvels at their lack of faith. So the question is, what would a faithful response have looked like? That's where this story starts to get practical. If we can answer that question, then, then, then we could put ourselves in that spot, couldn't we? We could ask that question of ourselves, what would a faithful response in our lives look like? So let's try a third approach, and let's put ourselves in the boat and think about it like this. If you are in a boat that is taking on water, and a man comes to you and says, do not be afraid, there are only two possible explanations. Number one, he doesn't know what he's talking about. Or number two, he knows something that you don't. He is either a fool who doesn't know what he's talking about, and thus he should be ignored so that you can get back to the very pressing business of trying to save your life, or he knows something that you do not, but that presumably if you did know, it would re-render the entire situation into one in which fear would no longer be the appropriate response. I'll explain it like this. Um, not too long ago, true story by the way, not too long ago, I went to bed one night, um, I go to sleep, in the middle of the night, this noise wakes me up. I hear this noise loud enough to wake you up. So I sort of come to, I'm a little bit groggy, a little nervous, right, because what was that bump? And as I'm coming to, eyes kind of glossed over, I look over and I realized somebody was in the house. And not only was somebody in the house, but that person had opened the door of my bedroom and was coming into the room toward me. And I panicked. I, I seized up with fear. And then I realized it was my six-year-old daughter. <laughs> Full disclosure for future parents in the room, this will happen to you frequently. You will wake up, and somebody will be staring at you. <laughs> and all of your worst nightmares will instantly be realized and then immediately dispelled. Because you'll realize that's not just a short little child murderer. That is, that is your child. That's, your, that's my six-year-old daughter who just wants some water or something. But think about it for a second. The only thing that changed in the whole story was I got some new information. Right? The minute that I realized, oh, <laughs> it's my daughter, it's my six-year-old, then everything I had felt up to that point all of a sudden now gets rendered as fear was no longer the appropriate response. In, in a moment, I go from terror to utter relief because I got some new information. 
I, I learned something about the situation I was in. So here's the real question for us tonight. What on earth does Jesus know that you and I don't? What is it that Jesus knows that is allowing him to be at rest when others are in a state of panic? And what is it that he knows that if you and I knew would transform the situations that you and I are in, not because the circumstances would even change, but it would render the situation into one where then you would see clearly fear is no longer the appropriate response. See, notice here, this is not even a call to bravery. This is not Jesus standing on the bow of the ship, staring down the wind as the disciples cower behind him. This is Jesus going, your response is unjustified. If you knew what I knew, then in theory, you would be in the same situation as well. You wouldn't be afraid either. What does Jesus know that you and I do not? Well, it cannot be. It cannot simply be that because of Jesus, I now have a cheat code to avoid bad weather. That can't be the missing piece of information. It cannot be the knowledge that now because of Jesus, I am safe from physical harm. Look at the, look at the long history of the church. And if that's true, how has that worked out for millions of people who have followed Jesus, who absolutely ran headlong into physical harm? the loss of their own lives. There's a lot of people, there's a lot of followers of Jesus, I would argue, that have been on boats where they prayed that Jesus would calm the wind and the waves, and it didn't happen. So it cannot be, this, this missing piece of information cannot be that simply that now because of Jesus, I, I'm safe from a storm. See, this is why I think you and I tend to get this story wrong. This is going to sound a little odd, but I think we get this story wrong because I think we get a little distracted by the miracle. I think we see the miracle, and it's almost like we get, we get drawn towards the miracle, and we miss what the miracle was trying to tell us about the person who did it. And this is not a new thing, by the way. Jesus knew this. Jesus frequently would tell his followers sift through them, if you will, filter through his followers and ask that question. He would say things like, you're following me because you got a free lunch. You're following me because you got your stomach filled and you're coming after me to see if maybe you could get a second one, which tells me you've missed the whole point of what the miracle was trying to illustrate for you. In Matthew 9, there's a paralyzed man that's brought to Jesus, and Jesus tells him, your sins are forgiven. And people look at the man, and they look at Jesus, and it says they perceive in their thoughts, who is this that even forgives sins? Like, who does this man think he is? Where does he have the authority? No one has the authority to do this except God alone. And Jesus says, so that you may know that I have the authority, he turns to the man and says, get up, pick up your mat, and walk. See, the miracles of Jesus, the miracles of Jesus, I would argue all, the miracles of Jesus were done primarily to demonstrate that Jesus had the authority to talk the way he talked. The miracle on the boat that night was to demonstrate that the man who's telling them, why are you afraid, is worth listening to because of what he has done. And that's proven and demonstrated by the miracle. But see, you and I, like the disciples in this story often get this wrong because we're quick to think that, oh, man, if I have Jesus, then I have a cheat code now to get out of the human condition. Maybe if Jesus is with me, then now I don't have to experience the things that everyone else has to experience. Jesus said, no, an evil and adulterous generation asked for a sign. The point of the miracle is not for you to think that now because of Jesus, you get a pass on the human condition. No, I would argue the reason Jesus did the miracle was to prove that he was the kind of person who had the authority to talk the way he talked. He wasn't a magician. And if you're attracted to the shiny miracles, you'll miss the point of the story. The point of the story 
is what the miracle is pointing to, what it's trying to ultimately say. The point of the story doesn't end with the miracle. It goes through the miracle and beyond it. And the point was not, the point was not that for the disciples, so long as Jesus was in the boat with them, that they were safe from it going down. The point what Jesus rebukes his disciples over, the reason Jesus asked his disciples, where is your faith, is he thought they should have known that if they were, that if they were with Jesus, they were safe even if the boat went down, even if it went down. The late Christian philosopher and teacher Dallas Willard said of this passage that it illustrates Jesus' core understanding of reality that this is a God-bathed and God-permeated world. It is a world filled with a glorious reality where every component is within the range of God's direct knowledge and control, though he obviously permits some of it for good reasons to be for a while otherwise than as he wishes. It is a world that is inconceivably beautiful and good because of God and because God is always in it. It is a world in which God is constantly at play and over which he constantly rejoices to Jesus. This present world is a perfectly safe place for us to be. Now, let's be clear. That might be the most moronic thing anyone could have said. I mean, that cannot be true. I mean, how delusional do you have to be to believe that this is a perfectly safe place for you and I to be? We had a uh, convocation last week where we had two men who shared the story of waking up and people are coming into their neighborhood and homes shooting. And you're telling me this is a safe world. There's a lot of things this world is. If you were to ask most people to talk about this world, safe would be low. How could this be a safe world? But see, here's the thing. Jesus isn't denying any of that. He isn't denying our experience. See, he's not denying what you and I do know and what we do experience in this world. In fact, Jesus could look at you and me and say, I see your troubled life and I will raise you mine. I know something about that. He's not denying, in other words, the very real threat of what can happen when you're on a boat that is filling up with water. He doesn't discount what you and I know. He just claims there's more to know. He claims that there's more to know than what you and I know. Because to Jesus, over this seemingly chaotic world that you and I experience, there is a good and loving Father who has not yielded his authority to another, and there is not one molecule out of his reach, and the arm of the Lord is not short. And so to Jesus, the only thing to fear is God, which is to say the only thing to fear is being out of relationship with the one in whom you were created to live, but joy of all joys, that God has made himself available to you in Jesus. That God knows you and holds you, and that God has a good and holy purpose for you, the one who holds the galaxies together by his word, the one who has the authority over the elements and over this world has freely entered into your and my human condition and has offered a kingdom and you are freely invited into it. What Jesus knows, the difference between you and me is that Jesus, all those songs that we sang a minute ago, you reign above it all. All that I am rests in your good and loving hand. The difference between you and me and Jesus is that Jesus actually believed it was true. Jesus believed that it was true. Jesus believed that it was true that the one who created all of it has now come in and through Jesus and can look at you and me and say, fear not. It is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. And so now, because the only one who can do something has done something, there is absolutely nothing. There is absolutely nothing that can separate you from his grip. No, neither life nor death, neither angels nor demons, neither the present or the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate you from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. The message to, 
The message to Jesus' disciples that night on the boat was that in Jesus, you cannot lose. And even if this boat goes down and you die, you will not die. For he who lives and believes in me will live even though he dies. And he who lives and believes in me will never die. If you saw the reality, if you saw reality the way Jesus sees reality, you would know in Jesus, you cannot lose. You cannot lose. So question, what would your life look like if you believed that? What would my life look like if I believed that? Whatever is the answer to that question, however you answer that question, that's how Jesus wanted his disciples to respond on the boat that night. I've got a name for it. It's called faith. See, it's not... It's not a spirit of arrogance. It's not a spirit of presumption. It is a humble, childlike trust that God holds you, holds your life, and he will fulfill his purpose for you. And if the boat goes down, not my preference, but if the boat goes down, then the firm grip of God on my life will not slacken for a moment. I will live even though I die. The love of God will hold me. It will sustain me. That is what Jesus knew that night on the boat that his disciples did not yet comprehend. He was asleep on the boat that night because Jesus was wholly resigned to the purpose of God for his life, and he knew that nothing, no man, no angel, no demon, no event, no accident, no storm on a sea could alter the purpose of God for him. So if the boat had gone down that night, Jesus would have gone down with the boat the same way that he ultimately went down on the cross, trusting the Father with his life. He would have wholly given himself over to the Father and say, if this is what it was supposed to be, then nothing has changed. And there is nothing I need to do to try to fight it, alter it. I'm convinced, I'm convinced, friends, that if you and I, I am convinced not even, I'm convinced when, I am convinced that when you and I get to the end of our life and we pass from life to life, when, when we see it, when we see Jesus, no longer in a mirror and dimly, but face to face, when we're on the other side of the veil, I'm convinced that we will look back and we will say that was a perfectly safe place for us to be. There was nothing, there was nothing that could have altered the purpose of God for my life. He was with me even in the moment where it seemed like all was lost. we will realize there was zero reason to be afraid back there. So gosh, if only we could experience now what we will know then. Oh wait, that's what Jesus is trying to tell his disciples. You don't have to wait. See, the kingdom of God has come near. It is not just one day I'll be safe. One day, on the other side of it, I'll finally be safe. That, see, what Jesus is saying is that now in him, the kingdom of God has come near. You don't have to wait. But see, this is why for Jesus, fear and anxiety are the inverse of faith. Because they are the ultimate tell as to who or what you trust. See, if the man comes to you on the boat and says, do not be afraid, friends, you have to make a choice there. You have to either believe him or you have to ignore him. And if you choose not to believe him, if you choose to ignore him, then you have to get back urgently to the very fierce business of trying to keep your life because time is running out. So go quickly, make something of yourself, find out who you are, go be that, go accumulate as much as you can, enjoy as much as you can in this quick, fast little life that is not promised to you. 
If, if that is your choice, then welcome to the rat race. Welcome to what the world offers. This world runs on anxiety. It is the fuel that runs the engine. If you and I can stay scared, if you and I are scared of our life and what we are to make of it in this super dangerous world, then you can be bought. Then you will buy whatever comes next. You will live in a constant state of trying to keep up, preserve it, keep it, make something of it, because the clock is ticking. You can either choose to trust the man or you can choose to ignore him, but here's what you can't do despite our attempt. You cannot look at the man and say, I believe you, and then go back to your frantic existence of trying to preserve your life. You can't tell him, I believe you, and then go back to your frantic existence. No, if I trust the man, then the evidence in my life would be my obedience to live in accordance with what he is telling me is true, even if I can't yet see it the way he sees it. That's called faith. It is my trusted response. It is my obedient response to live in accordance with what he is telling me is true, even if I can't see it, even if I don't fully know how this is going to turn out. But here's the thing, if you do that, then guess what will happen according to Jesus? We will begin to experience the joy of a life lived in the kingdom of God. We will actually not just be able to sing those songs, we could live by them. We would know that if Jesus truly does reign above it all, then nothing can stand in the way of God's purpose for me. So why am I resisting it? Why am I fighting it? We would begin to experience the joy of a life lived under the good and heavenly reign of a God who promises to be your shepherd and carry you forever, and you will learn how to be at rest even when others are in a state of panic. Now, don't get it twisted. None of this is meant as an invitation to just live carelessly or recklessly or carefree. That's not the point of it. If you're on a boat that's filling up with water, you should look for a bucket. I'll give you a story as a way of closing. Some of you might have heard the name John Harper. John Harper was born in the 1800s. And John Harper was seemingly destined to die by drowning. By the time he was 30, he had had multiple close shaves with drowning. When he was a child, he fell into a well, and his mother ended up miraculously saving him. When he was in his 20s, he was at the beach, and he went swimming, and a riptide pulled him out. And he couldn't get back in, but then a change in the current carried him back, and he survived. And then when he was in his 30s, he was on a boat in the Mediterranean, and it began to sink, but he was able to survive. So in April of 1912, when he got on a boat and it hit an iceberg, you had to know he was thinking, again? He was in his late 30s. He was a pastor. He was on the Titanic. His boat hits the iceberg, starts filling up with water. Fourth time this guy has had a close shave. But here's the thing, he had been there three times before. He had come to know, right? And the God who got me out of those other three, surely he can get me out of this. So here's what he did. He, he grabbed a chair and he uh, put it on the deck and he kicked up his feet and he said, what will be, will be. 
That is not true. That is not what John Harper did. John Harper ran to the deck and he started to try and help get people onto the lifeboats. In fact, there was one survivor of the Titanic who recorded that John Harper shared the gospel with him as the boat was going down and the man gave his life to Christ and later testified about it. John Harper got to work when the boat hit the iceberg. He stayed on the deck and he put his daughter in one of the boats and then he helped other people get onto the boats. In fact, he was going around yelling, make sure that the unsaved get on a boat. If you don't know Jesus, then you've got to get on one of those lifeboats. So he helps his daughter get on. He could have gone with her, but he chose not to. He stayed behind, and he continued to help people get into lifeboats until there were no more lifeboats. But here's the thing. Like, it's not like this guy was reckless. He had every intention of living, and he knew that the God who had done it before could do it again. In other words, for John Harper on the Titanic, his confidence in God's authority was not the excuse for his inaction. It was the catalyst for it. He was walking in such freedom because he knew um, the, God who can, the God who is authority, has authority over the wind and the waves, like he has this. So they get all the lifeboats out and then John Harper, um, he's not resigned to fate here. He grabs a life jacket and with others he jumps into the water and he starts looking for something to hang on to, something to pull himself up on so that he can he can maybe get rescued and whatnot, but then he sees a man who's thrashing in the water, and he doesn't have a life jacket, so John Harper took off his life jacket, he tossed it to the man, he said, you need it more than me, and he slipped under and he died. See, it's this picture of a guy who has gotten to the point in his life where he had such confidence that the God who had saved him, who had created him, and who held him. He knew, man, I'm just getting new information. I, I, I don't need to get on a boat because I'll let the other person get on the boat instead. I'm in the water. If, if I can grab a life jacket, but if I see something come up, I'm going to gladly throw it away. He slips under the water and dies. But just let me ask you, think about this for a second. In a place where can you imagine the panic? Can you imagine the scene and the hysteria? Think about how clearly John Harper was seeing that night. Think about the difference of somebody who's seeing it rightly and who's acting in accordance with what he knows is true. Acting in accordance in reliance on the God who held him and held his purposes for him. John Harper knew that he was free to give himself away to others. And if God chose to spare his life, John Harper knew he could. But if he didn't, what business of that was it to him? You cannot lose. See, if you find yourself on a boat that's taking on water, you should grab a bucket. You should grab a life jacket. But how you grip that bucket will tell a lot. How you grab will tell a lot. See, that's what Mark records for us. The disciples woke Jesus up that night and listen to what they say. They wake Jesus up and they say, don't you care that we are perishing? Don't you care, God? How often is that you're in my response? You're in the boat, and it's taking on water. Things aren't going the way you wanted. God, don't you care? Don't you see what's happening? Why don't you do something? Why don't you act? See, that is the way a person will respond. That is the way a person will respond if they are letting the external conditions of their life be the primary determinant for what they believe God thinks of them. That's how you and I will always respond if we let the external circumstances, the conditions we find ourselves, be the judge, be the determining factor for what we believe God says 
of us, but those who have come to let God and His Word be the primary determinant for how we filter our circumstances will live in a consistent state of peace and rest. You could find yourself in a place where others are in a state of panic and you are at rest. You are free. You are free to act, free to love, free to give yourself away because you know I cannot lose. Now, you might ask, how would I know? I mean, I'm not on the boat that's going down. It's true of John Harper, but how would I know in my life which one is true of me? Easy. How's your grip? How's your grip? How do you handle it when you start to see water in the boat of your own plans? How do you handle it when you get crossed? when it starts to tip against you. See, the very things that you and I are confronted right now in our life are the opportunity to practice what it would mean to respond the way that Jesus expected of his followers that night. Come to me, Jesus says, all you who labor and I will give you rest. It is an invitation to a permanent state of non-anxiety, a permanent state of rest, even if you find yourself scooping water out of a boat. Let's pray together. Father, increase our faith. Increase our faith, Lord Jesus. Lord, we believe. Help our unbelief. Help us, Lord. Live lives that are in accordance with what you said is true. Help us to be a people who trust you, who we don't just say it, but we live lives in accordance with it. And so right now, Lord, in this room, Every single person in this room could get up on this stage and share some boat of their own circumstance that's filling up with water. And we're seized up with anxiety and fear over it. Lord, increase our faith. Help us to see you more clearly in it. Help us to trust you more rightly with it. And as we do that, Lord, give us eyes to see it the way you see it. So that in how we respond to others, others would look at us and go, what do they know that I don't? How are they not afraid? How do they make the choices they make? Why do they make the choices that they make when others choose differently? Why aren't they anxious, Lord, in a world and in a culture and a generation that is crippled with anxiety? Let it not be true of us. We pray this in your name. Amen.
one of me. I'll be praising my Savior all the day long. So I will. God of Abraham, you be God of covenant, the faithful promises. Time and time again, you have proven you do just what you say. Though the storms may come and the winds may blow, I'll remain steadfast. And let my heart learn when you speak a word, it will come to pass. Great is your faithfulness to me. Great is your faithfulness. Saying, say, my will pray your name. Great is your faithfulness to me. You never change in the noise. In truth.
Yeah. 
May the glory of the Lord endure forever. May the Lord rejoice in his works, who looks on the earth and it trembles, who touches the mountains and they smoke. We say, I will sing praise to the Lord for as long as I live. I will sing praise to my God while I have being. May my meditation be pleasing to him, for I rejoice in the Lord. Let the sinners be consumed from the earth. Let the wicked be cast out. But bless the Lord, oh my soul. Praise the Lord, oh my soul. Let this be our offering tonight. We sing together. We say, the earth will show. Amen. Hey, as we, um, as I close us in prayer, I want to appeal to you tonight to please go to community group. And here's why. Because somebody, somebody needs you to be in community group tonight. Sometimes you need to see Christ and the truth of who Christ is in the life of someone else because in your own state, like, you're struggling with it. And so I pray that tonight in our community groups, they would be places where those of you who are struggling, those of you who find yourself in a season where you're in the boat and it's taken on water, and those of you who are, who are, who are looking around at the wind of the waves, like, you need to hear. You need to hear, not on this stage, you need to hear from a brother or sister in community with you, you need to hear them speak that into you, that you need to lean on them, share that. Do not walk alone in it. And those of you tonight who have been in those seasons before, be available to people. These community groups are not just, are not just something we do. They are the lifeblood of how this works. If that is broken, then the rest of this is a complete waste of time. This only works if we are walking it out in the lives of of the people around us. So please go to community group tonight, if not for yourself, for the sake of somebody who's gonna need you in it. Let me pray for us. God, thank you again for the gift of what you have given us in Jesus. Thank you for the vision that Jesus has. And thank you, Lord, that you did not leave us in our blindness, you did not leave us in our ignorance, but that you came and were available to us and you showed us the way in and through your own example teach us to trust you. We pray this in your name. Amen. Thank you guys. You're dismissed.